Welcome to Meets Pad, a platform dedicated to sharing breakthrough knowledge that is accessible to the meats industry. On each episode, we will hear from meat specialists and professionals to talk about numerous topics in meat science, including animal welfare, meat production, meat quality, food safety, and so much more. Hello, meat folks. Welcome. Welcome back to the Meat Spot Podcast. My name is Francisco Nohar, and we have Dr. Bass, as always, joining us on this exciting episode. Dr. Bass, how are you? I, I'm, I'm excited as usual. I'm a, little, I, I'm a little more mellow because I don't have my coffee because I have my tea. And the reason for that is because <laughs> uh, when I, I have a former graduate student colleague who's going to be joining us. And this is the only person I know of that has gone into a McDonald's and asked, do you have green tea? And, and I remember this from, from many, many years ago, of course. Um, and and uh, I, I don't know if he was able to capture the green tea, but he did capture an awful lot of imagination while he was here. Um, back, in, back in the early, early 2000s, um, I was at uh, Colorado State University working on my PhD, and I had the absolute privilege to work alongside Mr. Ken Kenichi Kato, Kato um, uh, who is a real live butcher in Japan um, and comes from a long line of butchers. And so, you know what, Ken, first off, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm actually drinking a coffee. Oh, yeah. Tea. There you go. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And he has his Colorado State mug, and I have my styrofoam cup like i normally would yeah. so. <laughs> um, i can't i can't it's in japan what time is it over there ken uh it's eight in the morning okay eight in the morning and yeah. and, and at the time of Next the recording day. it's 5 p.m yes. uh, central time so it's I, I i love the the i mean how how internet how this technology works that you can be like literally on it's the, on the other side travel. of the world yeah, it's time travel. <laughs> tell tell us how tomorrow is. It looks wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> well, hey, I I'd like to kick off um, the discussion here because what one of the things that I I I, I really value my time working with Ken um, d- during grad school and and he was able to teach me an awful lot about was um, the uniqueness of especially the beef over in Japan. Um, beef is, is was something that that I did a lot of research on, and Ken did, and and Ken is a, Ken is an expert meat cutter um, in the Japanese um, style. And so, tell us about what makes beef in Japan so special, and of, and of course this this magical and mythical Kobe beef. Sure, sure. Um, actually, in Japan, we call food actually wagyu beef probably. 20, 30 percent of the consumption is wagyu. Yeah, the 20 percent will be the dairy cattle, and 50 percent is uh, imported from the U.S. and the Australia. And the wagyu, um, since 1960, so my grandfather at that time was cattle broker. He brought a calf to the rice farmer. And the rice farmer used a calf or cattle to cultivate their own rice farm. Okay. Okay. Then my grandfather came back to the rice farmer to buy the um, actual animal when it gets old uh-huh. to, and then bring to the city side to sell the butcher. Okay, we use the cattle, not only just beef, but also the cultivation. Uh-huh. Um, till to, to, pull 90s. The, uh, to till the to till the land and to and to work right, the land. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Till the 1970s to yes. And then we kind of shifted to um more like a more like a beef for beef. Use cattle for more like a beef than just cultivate. So it's changing in 1970, right? And at that time, the economy was growing up. It's like expanded. So uh, people start eating more beef. 
um, at that time, the beef is still like a high value, high cost, or like expensive products of our uh, the protein as a protein. So um, we ate a very few, um, especially we have lots of fish. As you know, we are um, island. So our protein resource is more like a fish and some soy and some chicken and pork and beef. So beef is a very um, the short consumption at that time. So uh, we need to make that beef very rich taste and fragrance. So we um, feed the animal, we breeding the animal, uh, starting from 1960, 1970, maybe same as the American meat science started almost the same time. And then we focused on uh, much strong for marbling. Marbling. Not marbling just the weight. The, the big yeah. focus, right? Yeah. Yes, big focus, yeah. So, uh, and we success, yes. Yes, I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, the other thing in Japan is kind of the end of the culture of the traveling, you know, what, what do you guys call say in English? The culture came from Europe, you know, the West Asia and the East Asia, and the East Asia and the West Asia and China and coming to Japan. Okay. Yeah. You know, lots of cultures. Right. Yeah. The, the multi-culture influence. Is yes, that, kind yeah, of stuff. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. The, in Japan is more like a mixing culture. Uh-huh. Is the like kind of Japanese culture of, of the different breeds. Then, um, it's like a food culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we eat the uh, French, Italian. Uh, oh Chinese. yeah, yeah, the food. Yeah, the the food, um, the cuisines, the different cuisines. Yeah. yeah, the cuisine. Not only cuisine, but also other you know clothing. Everything yeah. we kind of um, the end of the culture travel from over the water. So we mixing a lot of cuisine in Japan. So we have a lot of way to eat a beef. So not only just steak, mm-hmm. not only just the, the cutlets, or we you know maybe sukiyaki shabu shabu. Mm-hmm. And even we can't not eat like sashimi, but we used to. Mm-hmm. And then we are able to eat every part of our meat yeah. for our cattle. So that's a kind of too big, um, the special thing of Japanese kind of wagyu. One is... Um, we focus on one marbling stuff. And second, we try to eat whole animal. Full utilization then. Oh, yeah. is, yes, it is. Yeah. I got a, a very quick one. And, and I think uh, going back to the multicultural influence, um, I, I see a lot of countries um, having a kind of, kind of a cross of the Wagyu or Kobe. I mean, we can talk about yes. Australia, South America, even here in the United States, a lot, some places, and, and, and Dr. Bass can, can talk a little bit. Uh, we had that uh, interview with Washington Beef. How's, how's that? I mean, how's the, like, let's say when, when this all started, like, okay, other people want to produce also similar quality as, as, as a Japanese beef. How, how does that work? How do you how do you go and, and teach um, how how to produce Japanese beef in other countries? Is there like a limitation for cultural? I mean, South America, United States, Australia. I mean, I don't know. You can talk maybe a little bit about that. Well, I attended the American Wagyu Association conference last year, and I found out a uh, kind of big uh, misunderstanding of the people. Uh, why the Kobe beef is not just about the Wagyu, actually, the definition of the Kobe beef in Japan, it has to be um, born in 
one area named Chogo Prefecture. It's like a, one prefecture, it's like a Colorado. Okay, so the Hyogo Prefecture, it has a Kobe city where we will have uh, ICOMS this year. Um, it has to be born in Hyogo Prefecture and raised in Hyogo Prefecture. Okay, then we have to, it has to be not only Wagyu breed, but also um, one breed in Wagyu. I mean, you would breed or like a family or a family tree. What do you guys call, call? it? It has to be uh, like a specific pedigree then maybe. Yes, pedigree, yeah. yes. Okay. Specific pedigree, yes. And then when it gets um, be a carcass, we make a grading and some specific grading, it has to be uh, above actually, we call A36. So we have A, B, C, it's uh, um, the side of the carcass and one to five is actual the grading. And we have a beef marbling standard from one to 12. Okay, the Kobe beef has to be A36, above A36. And the weight of the carcass, we have maximized. So 499.9 kilogram is a maximum. If the carcass bigger than 500, you cannot call Kobe beef for that carcass. And I'm not sure because of the uh, Kobe Bryant, <laughs> or <laughs> I'm not sure why Kobe beef is so popular in the world. But I understand uh, people say the Kobe beef or Tajima beef and Wagyu beef is almost the same to the people. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's very specific uh, definition we have. Okay. Well, and, so, and if I can if I can kind of add a little bit to that for the listeners out there, it, the way that I've explained it in the past is that like like you said the 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 cattle have to be born and raised in and around the city of of Kobe and then yeah. um it's almost like champagne true proper champagne has to be raised or, or or grown in mm -hmm. that specific region of France okay mm -hmm. and to truly call it Kobe it needs to it needs to follow those criteria and then and then you also mentioned that it has to have a carcass weight less than 499 kilograms or 499 yeah. kilograms or less, which for, for the American listeners out there, that's, that's, that's about 1100 pounds for the carcass. Um, and, and we know that we can make, we can make cattle pretty darn big. Um, but to hit the right marbling scores, marbling levels that, that Ken is mentioning, um, I, it, it really does take a special kind of breed of animal. Let me answer about the Francisco's question. Uh, how to create the Wagyu beef, like a Japanese Wagyu beef. <laughs> um, well, why is breeding? Yes. And why is nutrition, the feeding? Um, because the Wagyu has um, potential to have higher marbling um, than other uh, breeding uh, for beef. I'm sure about it. So if we control the breeding of Wagyu in the world, I mean, we decided not uh, export any genetics of um, Wagyu or semen or egg or embryo to other country, we decided to not do that um, anymore. So today, if we are able to get Wagyu in other worlds, it means we exported uh, to 1980, I forgot actual time of uh, where we exported, but um, that only 100 cattle is the, the source of the Wagyu in the world officially. Mm -hmm. 
still, uh, we are able to control um, the genetics uh, or breed, uh, the how much breeding we try to get from the genetically. And the second about the feeding, um, well, we still use controlling the vitamin A of the middle range uh, because vitamin A um, is kind of controlling of, um, how can I say? Um, can you explain about the vitamin A, how you how it affects to the actual animal? In English? Uh, well, well, the vitamin A, I mean, it's a fat-soluble vitamin. Right. Um, and I, I'm, from my perspective or from my background, it, it's, been, it's, it's more related to eyesight. I'd have to go back and look at um, how it would physiologically affect the animal. But, but you're mentioning it does take some special feeding. So, so you right. have to start with the right genetics. Okay. And, and again, if we use the, um, the example of wine or champagne, you have to start right. with the right grapes. Um, right. and, and then, and then you have to nurture it the right way. And so you're mentioning, right. um, you, you're feeding it a certain way, um, mm -hmm. and, and you're, and, and supplementing with vitamin A and I'll have to look, look that up, um, to see. Well, after we bake salt. So we make the vitamin lacking of the right vitamin A during the middle range. Okay. Yeah, as you know, uh, vitamin A control the how uh, the fat. How can I say fat? Um, if the cattle has a vitamin A, they kind of consume the the fat. Okay. They burn the fat. They are able to use the fat for energy. But if you short of the vitamin A. Um, they got stuck the fat um, above the 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 vine, such as the barbary. Okay, but so, if you okay, add, so it's a deficiency of vitamin A. Then you right, you, you right. restrict yes. vitamin A amounts, and then exactly. the animal doesn't maybe doesn't grow muscularly and skeletally to its maximum potential, but mm -hmm. that's helping to concentrate the marbling that's already right that's right. there in the meat absolutely fascinating wow right. okay but if you pop the vitamin a to feed them as you said the cattle get smaller right mm -hmm. so we found that when we should not feed that vitamin a so we control the level of the vitamin a actually so, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so uh, that's the kind of skill how we make the marbling. Mm -hmm. But today uh, we have so much marble uh, beef in Japan. Okay, so today's almost um, fifty percent of our cattle is A five. Wow. So it's like a prime plus plus plus. Each. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> well beyond uh, what would be considered prime in the United States. The uh, right. So, so, right. so the marbling potential of the and wagyu cattle is, is a four. Okay, thirty percent than... marbling. Okay, so eighty percent of our cattle is above uh, marbling score eight. Wow, such as prime plus plus or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. For those those listening, and and if you're not familiar with the with the Japanese beef marbling standards, uh, what would be considered high prime in the United States um, would be a marbling score of you, you mentioned eight, I believe. Okay, um, and so they have a, yet four more marbling levels beyond our highest standard that we can even uh, uh, apply to a carcass in the United States. Um, and, and so, so trying to help the listener understand just how much, how rich, how rich this meat really is, which makes it so special. Right. So, and then we have only 10% of marbling score of five to or six, I can say, or four to six, such as 
prime plus about. Mm -hmm. So less than that marbling is only 1% or 2%. So it means, you know, 90% of our Wagyu beef in Japan is beyond the prime. Yeah. So today, the lean meat, so less, you know, weaker marbling meat is rare. Yeah. So that's kind of a um, big challenge today in Japan to me. Okay. Yeah. Well, and to, to incorporate enough lean maybe into ground products, then you're saying? Uh, not only ground. Well, um, well, that's a good point because, of course, we, if we cut the lowing cuts, the longest doorside, of course, it's marble, right? Mm -hmm. But if you cut inside round of the uh, beef marbling score 12, you can find out marble. Yeah. So yeah. all muscle have marble cuts, even shank. Even the shank. <laughs> shank oh yeah. my goodness. I would I can't wait to come visit you, Ken. I need to cut <laughs> some some shank meat that has marbling in it. I that's, I do that's a good I, quote. I, yeah, even the shank is marble. Even the shank is rich. <laughs> yeah. So not for mar uh, the ground beef, but also for the steak mm. from the, the loin cuts. So it's like a sourdough steak. Yeah. Uh, we try to have one with a good balance of the marbling, yeah. but it's kind of difficult to get that cut because the uh, inside rounds it still has it, it has marble, but not as tender as the tenderloin. Right. Still, it's got different cuts. Yeah. So uh, that's a big um, issue today in Japan because uh, as a butcher uh, to the cons consumer, our customer. Uh, you may be know Japanese, um, the ratio of um, the over 50 is um, how many percent? Like a 40% today. Okay. Yeah. And 70% uh, of our population will be over uh, 50 next 10 years or something. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we are getting older. The older, uh, the the leaner was preferred. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's very difficult to sell the high too much marbling. Well, and th and that may indeed be domestic, but I'll tell you the uh, the idea even of of Kobe beef and Japanese or originating beef mm -hmm. internationally. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's exploded. There's so much interest in this and there has been for many years, something yep. I want to yep. follow up, Ken. And, and I think you told me a little bit about this many years ago when you and I were working mm -hmm. together, but uh, is about the feeding. Okay. Yes. And I want you to, I want you to just tell us outright what, what's going on because there are many stories uh, yep. that, that um, the farmers are out there and they're feeding them um, uh, Sapporo and sake, <laughs> and they're brushing them yeah. down every day and maybe singing yeah. to them. How much of that is true and how much how much of that is maybe myth? Okay. Um, well, people keep asking about it. Um, well, I gave the answer. Well, A, uh, nobody feed the uh, alcohol or beer or sake. To the animal, no. Well, some farmer gave the, some alcohol to uh, their cattle before they bring the animal to the slaughterhouse before oh, harvesting. See. Yeah. Um, the brushing, yes. Uh, we have to cleaning up the cat, uh, the cattle before it bring to the um, the the meat plant. Oh, okay. It has to be cleaning it up. It's a, it's not just because of uh, they got calm, but um, uh, it's a, a, a food safety consumption. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the dirty you know animal it's not allowed to get into the meat plant. Right. So if it's dirty, we have to clean it up before it get into the um, the actual meat plant. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, that so, makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the also, um, but 
I believe we treat more gently to the animal because um, today's average of heads of animal per farmer, uh, it should be, um, I forgot the number after a number. It's not huge like in, Japan, in the United States. Um, sorry, I forgot the, name, the well, number. That's okay. I mean, it's, it's a small herd size though, is what you're saying. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So because we in Japan, uh, I can tell 60 head. <laughs> 60, six zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay. or 60 zero, yeah, per yeah. one farm. Okay. okay. The large farm feeding thousands, so 2,000, 3,000, yes. Okay. But the 60, or like my, uh, the farmer who I usually purchase is almost 100 to 200. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then one pen, they put five to six animal. Okay. In one pen. So they are able to take care for each animal. It's much okay. more intensive than, yes, and, yeah, and, and then compared to our, uh, you know, very common to see a, a feed yard in the United States in, in the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. and, and each pen may contain two to 300 animals at a time. And right. so, yeah, it's right. a different, it's a different strategy. Of course, we're, right. we're still making sure that the animals are cared for. It's just, it's a, it's a different management system. And of course, those animals in Japan, you can ask a lot more for. And and, that, and and I think that's that's what I I, I wanted to to follow up, especially on on my question on just trying to have the, this type of uh, this type of cattle uh, somewhere else. I mean, it, when you talk about genetics, I think we can talk a little bit about between the balance of yeah. genetics and the practices to achieve that yeah. quality. And yeah. I, I'm not sure if. if if you can tell us more about that, uh, especially so I know you you interact a lot with uh, ranchers and farmers and like outside Japan, yeah, right, right, and, right. and maybe the impact of okay, you got the genetic, but okay, what's what's beyond that to achieve the goal? Yes, um, the first, uh, how much big it is, you know, depending on if you have a huge feed lot, you cannot control the each animal, right? It's it's impossible. Um, but if you less than 200 heads, 300 heads, you actually recognize each animal. Okay. In Japan, um, we check uh, each specific animal's pedigree, and we, or our farmer, uh, knew uh, which pet pedigree will be uh, fit what kind of uh, feed to be a higher margin or getting bigger. Okay, so they kind of control a little bit every day. They check the how they, um, not only just how they look, they check the poops, they check the, you know, how they um, uh, the move, how they attract um, during the day, daytime. So they check the, each animal, then they control feed a little bit for each animal. So that's the kind of one big difference between Japan and the uh, other countries. Um, but, well, yesterday I talked to the, uh, the ranchers and they asked me how we should feed. So I just asked what kind of taste and fragrance you want right so just marbling uh we call if we if we if you want to just marbling uh please check the vitamin a volume during especially during the age of um 15 months to no no actually 12 months to 20 months yeah you have to some um um, vitamin A volume, you have to control some, uh, how can I say, um, uh, uh, you make the limit of the vitamin A during that, that time. 
So you will be able to get the vitamin, uh, the marbling. So after uh, 20 months uh, old, uh, you should feed more vitamin A than they actually required. Otherwise, they will not get bigger or they got sick. So it means uh, you have to control one by one, not just the, the big volume. Yeah. Very, very intensive farming then. Yeah, uh, you, 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 controlling the or 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 intensively managing um, mm -hmm. each individual animal, um, right. and and to give the folks listening out there maybe a little bit of perspective, um, uh, and this is going to lead into my next question, which is which is about special cuts that are in Japan because you you talked mm -hmm. about how even the shank meat, you you'll you'll pull that out specifically. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and the marbling that's associated with it. Um, but what mm -hmm. is the approximate average cost of an A5 beef carcass? Okay. Uh, if, if that's well, something you can convert for us. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, well, um, the average of the A5 carcass, it must be, um, today it's a COVID-19 situation, so it's at the lower price than usual. Okay. Uh, today it be uh, like a three like a thirty um, dollar per kilogram. So uh, thirty dollars per kilo. Yes. So fifteen dollar per pound as a yep. carcass. Okay. Yep, at least, yeah. As a carcass as a whole carcass. Okay. Wow. So it should be, if you say like uh, 500, um, not the Kobe beef, uh, but other cattle, the, ha the average of the, our carcass in Japan today is like a 500 to 600 wow. kilogram. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. I oh know. my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Times 3030, uh, there are so, um, uh, yeah, fifteen thousand dollar. Yeah, about right? fifteen. Yeah, that's that's the math that I'm getting. Yeah. I'm I'm using yeah. a little bit smaller uh, mm -hmm. carcass, maybe like a four hundred kilogram times two point two. That's eight hundred eighty pound carcass, which is that that's a good relative one for our listeners here in North America. Is that's a pretty average yeah. size carcass in America. Um, mm -hmm. So if you say a four hundred kilogram mm -hmm. carcass at thirty. Mm -hmm dollars approximately thirty dollars a kilogram that's yep. twelve thousand dollars that's twelve twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars for the mm -hmm. carcass we haven't even cut yes. any steaks yet right. right you must you must when you go pick up your your beef you must go you must drive in an armored van i mean that is right. that's <laughs> that is some very very fancy meat that you're carrying yes <laughs> yes <laughs> Well, and, and tell us a little bit, if you can, about yeah. maybe some unique cuts that that right. our listeners may be unfamiliar with. Well, um, let's see, unique cuts. Because you wouldn't obvious. necessarily um, just just cut a chuck roll or a, or a, um, a do you do you just normally cut regular ribeye steaks, or do you maybe piece those pieces apart? Yeah, sure. Um, we are able to get like a sixty different cuts from one animal. Okay, six, even inside six run. zero different cuts. Yes. Wow. Even inside, you know, inside round, I separate like a four different cuts. Oh wow! Because um, the inside round of um, the parts, it's a huge muscle, right? Mm -hmm. So near to the knuckle or near to the um, the um, how can oh, I say to the eye of um, round? Yeah, eye of round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a different taste. Sure. So we separate the inside round uh, to four different cuts. Um, or how? Oh, the the you can see the leave eye. Um, beside the Levi, uh, what's that say? The spinalis. Uh, spinalis so, yeah. Yes. Oh, we wow. separate. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we, of course, um, 
uh, uses different cuts for each. Um, because there's, you know, thick fat between those and uh, those cuts. So, right. Um, what else? Oh, uh, the the here. Um, the biceps. Biceps femoris. Yeah. Uh-huh. A BSF, we use the cuts for yakiniku. So it's like a grill. Really? Yes, we do. So, Not so, you. so yeah, right. So, so for our, our listeners out there, if you're less familiar with some of the, the anatomy on a beef carcass, the biceps almost always will go into stew or ground beef in the United States right. because it's right. so lean. And you're saying yes. you'll, you'll, you'll slice that into grilling. Items. Grilling, yes. Um, because it looks like the same as shank meat, mm-hmm. but that's um, the seam is totally different. Yeah. There are kind of two different seam. Why it's, it's very chew. Mm-hmm. Why it's very easy to bite. Uh, you know, flap iron. F- a flat, flat iron, yeah, flat iron. Flat yeah. iron yeah. or a bread steak. You can find that seam yeah. inside, right? That seam. Is you can bite, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of different. Yeah. Yeah. So we separate almost every cut by themes, yes. So we That's try awesome. to maximize, yeah, try to maximize um the uh, the potential of each cut. So um how would a zoom and 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 I'm really hoping that ICOM is going to take place this year, so we can potentially start planning uh, some some interviews over there. But um, I really want to go to a retail uh, business or a butcher or a supermarket to see how how what you beef is marketed. Um, what are some like just especially the main difference? And I'm sure you've been here in the states. Um, yes. What are some of the, the main differences that you see how how meat is marketed between the United States and Japan at the retail oh. level? The retail level, well, um, I was in the United States till 2008. I graduated college state, uh, the Master of Meat Science in 2008. And I came back last year, uh, 2021. Um, I stopped the supermarket there. And I in Colorado, I was surprised how much fish they sell the last 10 years. Um, but in Japan, we um, sell more meat than fish. Um, last 10 years, yeah, the, the consumption of the meat is getting bigger. Um, and the market, as I said, the market consumption in Japan about the beef, not only beef, but also pork. The far, half, like fifty percent of the consumption of beef and pork are, came from the United States and Australia, or Canada for pork. So uh, the biggest differentiation is we imported a lot of beef. Well, I know the U.S. imported a lot too, but um, if you go to the supermarket, fifty percent of the meat is. Um, came from the US or Australia, it's kind of different in Japan, in the United States, I believe. Um, also, so I want to know, um, people believe the Japanese, pe- Japanese uh, consumer eat lots of marbling beef, but it's not true. <laughs> It's just twenty percent, or yeah. maybe, yeah. Well, and it's it's expensive too, and so so one of the, um, you know, and 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 maybe to to talk a little bit about what Francisco mentioned is that um, my assumption is that you you don't have big thick steaks in the supermarkets in Japan like we would maybe have here in the United States. Is that right? It's it maybe smaller portions and smaller cuts. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's different. Okay. Uh, I was surprised in the United States uh, last year. Uh, you guys start selling about cuts to big cuts. Why is brisket? Why is dry beef? Why you guys just sell that to cuts so familiar? 
I, I was surprised how getting familiar with that. Barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of barbecue. We are a barbecue nation, Ken. <laughs> it used to be, you know, only loin cuts mm -hmm. and the tenderloin and some round cuts, the big chunk of round cuts, and ground beef. Yeah. Right? That's all. Right. right. Either loin or round, ground beef, I can say. Yeah. But in Japan, even United U.S. beef, we use every cut <laughs> yeah. as a fresh meat. That's kind of the big difference, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah and, and selling it as more of a whole muscle item than, than say, making grinds. To maximize a higher price. Yeah. Because if yeah. you sell the ground beef, maybe um, $300 per, I don't know, $3 per kilo, uh, per 100 grams. So like a twelve dollar per pound. Okay, twelve dollars per pound. For the, yeah, for the ground beef, right? Mm -hmm. But if you do uh, some grill cuts, you can sell twice more expensive. Right. Even yeah. same cuts. Right. So yeah. we try to you know make more money from the imported beef. Oh sure, yeah. Well, and and it and it makes sense, you know. I mean. The reality is, is, is as you've mentioned, um, Japan is an island nation, limited in in mm -hmm. so, in, in farmland, and so yep. um, yeah, imports are 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 a necessity to make sure that right. the population right. continues to get the protein and 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 can eat delicious meals. And so yeah, I right. think I think it's great to bring that in, but you also have to truly not just optimize, but really almost maximize. The maximize use yes of of yes. those items not it's beyond yes. and I'm, <laughs> right so. and i always i always keep saying don't abuse the right. good cuts yeah don't abuse the good cuts in the us right. yep. yeah yeah <laughs> i was like wow why don't you use that cuts for just grill you know yeah. uh the last year i actually show how treat you know how fabricate our cuts mm -hmm. and i worked with um the the guy from the CSU Meat Lab. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking how you use this cut. And they say, it's just ground beef. I was like, no, you should do that. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, the grill it is, it's tasty. Yeah. Right? Something like that. <laughs> well, and and I'll tell you, tell the whole listeners as we as we begin to land this plane. Um, Ken Ken taught me about a lot of things. And and one of those was um uh, and and for our for our, our our small operators out there who do um, uh, 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 harvest beef, is that the tendons have some great value as well. And 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 yes. I I remember very well when when Ken asked me to save the tendons, and I yeah. kind of looked at him sideways and said, I don't know what you're going to do with that. But he went and made some absolutely amazing stew with it um, yeah. that that I was I was beside myself, and so. Really, what I'm what I'm trying to tell the listeners out there is this is this is just merely one uh, direction that that we can go to learn more about meat cutting. And I think I've already mentioned it on this program, but a, a dream of mine would be to travel the world and just go cut meat with different butchers in different countries. And can one day that's going to happen? I'm going to come. Yeah. I'm, maybe you'll let me clean the counter because I'm not allowed to touch that expensive meat. But, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but man, you know what? I, I, I think we could, we could talk for another couple hours. Um, let's, let's keep the conversation going and hopefully let's, yeah. we'll be able to. Visit, let's put part, uh, let's uh, <laughs> record part B or part two of this uh, in Japan. And, and I think we can do a little bit of a cutting if, if, if time allows us and, and I think I'm just looking forward to to getting to know you in person, Ken. Uh, if, 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 as I said uh, before, we started recording. If COVID allows us to to start traveling more, well, thank you, Ken, for joining us today. I think we for sure uh, enjoyed this conversation with you, and I'm I'm certain that a lot of processors will benefit from this conversation. Doctor Bass, you got anything else to add on um, before we well. wrap it up? You know, it, it's just such a pleasure to see Ken and to, and to hear him and um, just keep up the good work, man. So. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank, yeah. And thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right.